Hi, my name is Grant and I work for the City Institute. Uh, the City Institute exists to mature and equip people in the Bible. And today we want to give you a little sample, a taster of what we do at the City Institute in one of our equipping courses, where James is actually teaching you how to do word studies. So if you enjoy this course, we would love for you to sign up in April uh, to join. We have two courses, one in our maturing vein called Foundations and the other one in how to study biblical genres. So if you get something out of this course, we'd love to see you in April. April. Well, we're going to be doing word studies this evening. And basically, as you guys heard in week one, the Bible wasn't written in English. So the thing is that we have to do a little bit of a study to find meaning there. So I'm going to be clicking through uh, my slides for now. Just now we're going to step into the step Bible and I'm going to let you know when we do and you're going to have your devices ready to go for that exercise. But for now, have your booklet open, right? No, everyone's got a no clue. So we're all on the same page, which is page 62. We are gonna be on that page. Um, but you can read the memes and how we got the Bible and all that stuff, it'll all be good. But I'm glad everyone's on the same page, no clue. So firstly, I wanted to settle the question, why do we even do word studies? Like, is there a point in that? I thought it was good enough. We can do Grant's follow method and be like, go to heaven that way. Well, I just thought we'd go through some, some obvious things and some less obvious things. Why we do word studies, number in, is because the Bible is made up of words. So if we want to know the Bible, we're going to have to be able to know what those words exactly mean. So that's pretty straightforward. Secondly, we've said in week one, translation perfectly from one language to another does not exist. It's impossible to exactly get the meaning across. By the way, tangent... For those of you who are speaking about the Good News Bible, hey, that's the one that you've got there. Um, you, a lot of you had questions about it and I looked it up and it's a really good literal word for word translation with just dumbed down and more accessible wording, but very literal. Good News Bible, super good. Anyway, um, the translations are imperfect to get correct and accurate. And so you have to do a bit of word study to actually arrive at the original meaning. It's not copy paste. Thirdly, because the meaning of words change over time. How many of you know that? I mean, we, we read in the Bible that the Holy Spirit is our comforter. And so we assume by that because of today's meaning that the Holy Spirit like, comes to hug us when we're feeling down, like he's our comforter, when in actual fact the original meaning of comforter was cum forte with strength, that the Holy Spirit is our comforter, he comes to bring us strength for the battle. But we've lost that meaning in English. So when we read comforter, we have the wrong association of the word. And so we need to do word studies because sometimes the way that we use these English words has actually morphed over time. And so that's another reason. And fourthly, simply it gives us a deeper understanding of the verse if we understand exactly what the original author meant. And so we want to do word studies. I love to do word studies. I want to know the depths of what this Bible verse means. And Grant mentioned this in a previous week. We need to be in two games. The one game is knowing the whole Bible and all the context, and the other game is digging down and understanding one verse, like zooming in super close. And word studies, we're in that game right now, of zooming in and making sure we get extract all the meaning from a verse. So that's why we do word studies. It's hugely important if you wanna take your Bible study to the next level. So, we're gonna actually do one together and it's actually exampled in your booklet. So if you can turn with me to page 62 of your book and on your device that you have with you, we're gonna to go to the Step Bible. I'm gonna go out of my slides and I'm going to go into my browser which is gonna come up for you guys on the stream. And okay, here's Grant playing around with, with stuff. Here, if you guys are all with me, you're on page 62 in your booklet, but we're going to our browser on whatever device you've got. And what we are looking for is the stepbible.org. This has come up as a suggestion, but it's those little blue thingies, is the icon to your left that you should, you should see. And when you click there, you should see what you see on my screen slash what it is in the book, because those are 100% the same. 
if you don't see what we are showing you or what's in your book, put thumbs down. Thumbs down if something's amiss and Grant somehow will try to troubleshoot uh, that. I don't know how. But just to let us know, like we need to have an indication that people are with us or people are not getting what we're getting, right? Okay, so I'm going to assume everyone's with me. We're at the Step Bible. It looks like this. This is going to be the tool that I'm going to use tonight to teach you how to do a word study. Now, in this web page, it's very, very cool because you can compare translations. If you type, we've got Genesis 1 that's a default on this website. And we're looking at the moment at the ESV because the ESV is very cool. But maybe we want to know what the NIV might have to say. And so you can type NIV, NIV into the search bar, click it, and it's going to start to give you a comparison between ESV, NIV. You can go three layers deep here. You can even get Diervolt's favorite translation, the NASB, the New American Standard, because we like all American now, we can like take a look at that. We can compare and contrast because we're good Bible students. So we like to compare and contrast, right? So you should be seeing, you might not have typed into the search bar as I have. You might still just have your ESV up there. But this is already helpful for you. If you're not into the Greek and Hebrew stuff that I say, I'm gonna say tonight, my suggestion would be do this on the Step Bible. Go and look up some of your favorite verses like we had an exercise two weeks ago or so and look it up in different translations. Very helpful in and of itself, just like that. So if you turn, um, you don't have to turn over the page, but uh, what we're gonna be doing now is I'm gonna demonstrate for you what we see in the booklet here. I'm gonna take away these arbitrary translations and only be left with the best, right? This. Okay, Okay. so hopefully that's more legible now. Um, and that is the right English, eh? Okay, so I just wanted to demonstrate something that we also see in the booklet here. So when you hover over a verse here, now I don't know how it's gonna look in your, on your phone, but if you were on a PC for sure, and you hover, okay. If you're on a PC, you can hover over a word. If you're on your phone, you have to click on a certain word. Now I've gone to God. And it's, there's a little blue thing that rocks up here at the bottom of my screen. And it says Elohim. And it tells you some information about that word. It says it's a plural, and then it starts to give you a definition of God according to that scripture. This is already helpful for you because you don't have to dive deep into a word study to get a surface level understanding of this is Hebrew, of the Hebrew that was written there. So this is already helpful, guys. If you just open this, you open up your verses and you start scrolling over words, you're gonna to start to see what the Hebrew meaning is and what the Hebrew names are. Another interesting thing you can do here, I'm just quickly demonstrating this and we're gonna move on to other matters. You can actually type into the search bar an English word. I'm gonna take out Genesis 1 and I'm gonna type sin because we like it, okay? And then I'm gonna pick sin in this specific Hebrew over here. And it's going to tell me every time that the Bible uses that Greek, ugh, that Hebrew word for sin. If we can see in the top right, there's 152 results of that word for sin. And we can see it's being used all over the show. It's starting there with the gospels and we're going down and we're going down and we're seeing all the, and this is only in the New Testament. I'm not gonna get into why, although I do have an explanation. It's, this is hamartia, it's Greek. So it's obviously showing up New Testament. I obviously misclicked. So this is a helpful thing when you're trying to do a word study, you're trying to understand like, listen, I wanna get to grips with how this word is used in the Bible. You type it into the search bar and it's going to show you the Greek or the Hebrew corresponding word for that English. It's really, really helpful. And you can see that in your booklet on the bottom of page 64, I'm just tracking exactly what we've got there. Now, you can also um, go and click on something here. Let's just, let's just go here to sins. And I've clicked on sins. And what has happened is in addition to the blue thing that's come up at the bottom, we have a helpful tab here on the right-hand side. And it tells you 
here's the Greek word, hamartia, right? It tells you the meaning over here in this block. Sin, wrongdoing, usually any act contrary to the will of the law of God, of God. And then it goes on to explain more about it. So this is really helpful. You can track along with me in your booklet in page, on page 65 that this is what, how you actually find out more about the word that you're trying to study. So I hope that makes sense to you. That is how you use this, this device. That's how you use this software. And that's how you arrive at better knowledge of what something means. And so if you turn over the booklet um, to page 66, I've said we're gonna actually do one together right now. And I'm gonna follow exactly what it says in the booklet in order to make sure that everyone tracks with me. It's gonna be super easy. Because our time is short tonight, I'm gonna do just one Greek word study. I'm sorry about that. But we're gonna do four quick Hebrew ones. Um, so we're very unbalanced, but that's cool. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and click away this search of Hamartia. And what I'm gonna do is I'm going to type in the scripture that we are concerned with tonight, which is Mark chapter nine, verses. I'm not gonna do the full context. Let's just do verses one to three, okay? If we had time, i will do the whole thing. But I'm typing that in, and we're looking at a passage which is famously called the transfiguration. And we're gonna do a word study on the word transfiguration. I'll tell you why in a second. But just to get the context, Jesus says um, to the disciples on this specific day, truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. By the way, you need to have this on your device. So we're tracking on the booklet, right? But you need to actually go on your device. You need to type there, Mark 9, verses 1 to 3. And you need to type in the search bar to make sure that you can do it. And if you are struggling with something, it's a thumbs down, right? So you type in your search bar, Mark 9, 1 to 3, okay? And Jesus says, you will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. Now something happens that links with that statement. The Bible scholars have sort of separated this into a different section, but there's obviously a link there because we're about to see something about the kingdom and power right now. And it says that after six days, Jesus took with him three guys, Peter, James, and John. And he led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. So we are concerned today with studying this passage. And if you look at that, and you wonder to yourself, what seems like a difficult word there? I think a lot of us would pick the word transfigured because that's not a word we use casually. And so maybe there's a little bit behind that that we don't understand. What does this transfigured actually mean, right? And so what we do, and you need to do this on your devices. So we've opened up the page and everything. We're on page 67 right now. I'm on step four. You need to scroll over the word transfigured. If you're on a PC, if you are on um, a, a device, you just click there. What you should see, and I'm calling attention to the blue block at the bottom, is that what we should see is it means to transform in its most basic um, translation. Transfigured means to transform. But we read there the Greek word is metamorpho. It's a passive that means to tr be transformed, transfigured, or change in form. Okay. So we see that it also mentions in the blue block there to change external figure, but we also see already that there are other references of transfigured. We have Matthew 17 verse two. Hopefully you see that in the chat in the blue. That is another gospel account of the same passage. But then interestingly, we've got two other ones, Romans 12, two and 2 Corinthians 3, 18. Hopefully you see that. Um, that's very important intel for us as we want to try to study this word because we want to know not just what does it mean here, but what does it mean there? And maybe understanding the word better is going to help us. So I've, I've said here on page 68 that there's some basic observations, that it means to transform, observation one. Observation two, 
that now we know what the Greek word is, even though we can't necessarily read in Greek. We can see their metamorpho because they've transliterated us for us. Number three, we notice that the tense was passive, which means that if you read the sentence, he was transfigured. It happened. It happened to him that he was transfigured. It happened to pass. Okay, observation number four, the more detailed explanation was that Jesus was changed in form. That's what I said on page 68, and we can see that in the blue block already. So, we're gonna try this ourselves. We're gonna click on transfigured at home, and all of your stuff comes up on the right here. It shows you the meaning, and I've asked a question in the booklet which says, now that we have this information, form a, uh, formulate your own detailed sentence of verse two, but instead of the word transfigured, put what you now understand that to mean. Now, obviously, you don't have time to go and think about it. But if you just say there, Jesus was changed in form before them, because that's literally what we just read. That's supposed to be what's happening in the book up there. That what happened was Jesus was changed in form before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. Okay, that's very important. You need to be able to insert your new understanding to reform the sentence that you're looking up. I asked the question here, and you can throw down answers in the chat. Does this reform your understanding of what you initially understood by this verse? Does this verse make more sense now? Does this verse make deeper meaning now? To what extent, this is like an interpretation question. To what extent would you say that Jesus was changed? in that moment. To what extent was Jesus changed? Um, I have a follow-up question which is related. Did Jesus change into some other form that he was not before? Or did Jesus reveal a form which was formerly concealed? These are deep questions. But they're the type of questions that come from when I read the sentence that he was changed in form. So when I read he was changed in form, which I didn't necessarily know before, now I have a question. Was that form a new form which he put on or was that a form which was within him that he now revealed? And the difference between them is huge. And so I'm not going to let you stew over it too much. I'm gonna give you my opinion and I'm happy to be corrected. But the way that I believe what happened there is God in all of his glory was always, it was always a concealed glory that Jesus came down on earth with. But in that moment, the glory that was usually concealed in Jesus, his inward form that he actually is was revealed. That he didn't change into something he was not, but rather who he was was revealed in that moment. And that is a, a profound thing in terms of my life as I read, I read this in this verse. So, we're gonna park that, you might disagree with me, that's fine. We're gonna park that and we're gonna move on to the fifth observation, which is that there's actually two other verses with transfigured in it. <coughs> so that's Romans chapter 12, verse two, and that's 2 Corinthians 3, 18. So we can actually see, okay, here's related words. Occurs in the Bible four times. If you are in your app and it says on the right hand side, occurs in the Bible four times, click on, on four times. And that is gonna give you the four instances below one another. And you can actually go and look at those. So Romans 12, two, we've now seen a little bit what happened with Jesus and he was transfigured. Well, let's try and use that understanding of the word metamorpho to try and interpret Romans 12, two. Romans 12, two, Paul says to these dudes, do not be conformed to this world, but be metamorpho, transformed by the renewal of your mind. How do you know that that, that is the metamorpho? Because it's highlighted in the step Bible. It's got like a little gray around it. He, but he was metamorphoed. Oh, sorry. Don't be conformed to this world, but be metamorphoed, transformed by the renewal of your mind so that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So I think I've maybe, maybe jumped ahead. What do you understand then in light of what we've just understood? 
from metamorpho for that to have reformed your meaning of Romans 12 too. Because if you read it like with just like a plain read, it looks like saying like, don't be conformed to this world, but be almost like, um, but choose for this renewal of your mind, for that transformation to happen. There's something profound in that Jesus' true nature was actually revealed in one moment. And that, that same word is being used here. Don't be conformed to this world, but what God has deposited in you through his spirit, allow that to be more, have more control over your mind over time. Even as the revealing, the metamorphosis is, by the way, the metamorpho is where, where metamorphosis comes from. The same way that a caterpillar goes from degree to degree into a butterfly, it's a transformation of the true nature of the butterfly just in a previous stage. Don't be conformed to this world, but what God has started in you, be renewed by the transfiguration of your mind. Are you with me? Like this, this verse is taking on a little bit more deeper meaning, and you might have even better revelation than me on how, but it's starting to take on better form. Now, uh, let's just see, where did I write this? In class example, yeah? Okay, cool. Uh, you guys agree? I wanted to take a look at the even more profound one, which is 2 Corinthians 3.18. Maybe more profound just because of my understanding and being less good of uh, Romans 12. It says this, and we all with unveiled face, beholding the glory of God, are being transformed or transfigured or metamorphosed in the same image from one degree of glory to another. This comes from the Lord who is spirit. Are you guys with me here? We're on page 70. And here we are, we're looking at the context, and I'm not going to belabor the context, except to say that this context is talking about Moses. We, it says in verse 13, we are not like Moses who had to put a veil over his face so that he, um, and it goes to speak about that. Now Moses had a veil over his face in the Old Testament. Um, I had a question, one, why did he have that veil over his face? Because he would literally die. The glory of God was too overwhelming for Moses. He wore a veil over his face. That's a dividing thing that protected him from being all consumed by God's glory. That was question one. But it's really important here because we, I asked the question, what is the relationship between this passage and the transfiguration moment? Matt and Robinson, you guys with me? What is the relationship? Now, you might have a more profound answer than mine, but I would like to suggest to you that the revealing of glory of Jesus is very similar to the revealing of God's glory in the days when Moses got to behold him. However, there's an even more profound connection between these two. And that is this verse that we're looking at that we all with unveiled face get to behold the glory of God. And as we are doing that, we are being transfigured into his exact same image from one degree of glory to the next. So this is a huge drop of, if you, have you, if you didn't know that this was the word metamorpho, you would read the sentence to say with, without like, hiding our face from God, we're being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to the next. But what you don't see there is it's not that we're being changed into something we're not. It's that we are changing into something that God has made us into. It says here, by the Lord who is spirit, we are being transfigured from one degree of glory to the next. Like the true nature of a butterfly, is what it is, but it's in one form in a, in a, at a caterpillar in a, in a cocoon. But one degree of glory to the next is becoming what God has made that, caterpillar, that butterfly to be. I don't know, since my preach on Sunday, I've got the butterfly thing in my head. But anyways, this is something, something amazing that Moses had no access to see God. But us, we don't need a veiled face. And as we get to behold God with no restrictions, we get transfigured into Him. We become Him. We become exactly like him, although it happens in stages from one degree of glory to the next. Nonetheless, it says in, in 1 John that when we see him, we will be like him. 
that one day when we behold Jesus, we'll be exactly like him. But hey, even now, as we behold Jesus, we are being transfigured from one degree of glory to the next. Just like when Jesus stood on the mountain and there his glory shone out, there are times when you see your spouse and you see your friend almost revealing their godly nature in a way that's a reveal. It's like, flip, I didn't know that these guys just have something so pure about them. There's something so radiant and so holy and so amazing in this person that I didn't see. They're just revealing their true nature there. And all the rest of the time, we're just unraveling. We are being sanctified. We are going from one degree of glory to the next. We're unraveling who God has made us. We're being transfigured. The glory isn't just that Jesus was transfigured, but even better, we are being transfigured. Are you guys with me? Is this connection making sense? This is, this is when the word study starts to lead us to new revelation about the very way that we change. So it's no longer just a story about what, what exactly was the word, uh, how Jesus was transformed. It, it, it takes on a meaning and an application for us that becomes real.